our Redeemer. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, peace be with you. So a man named Pilgrim wanted to become strong and healthy, and he did some research. What do I need to do to become strong and healthy? And so he said, well, working out, exercise. And so he thought, okay, this is great. That's, that's you know, I'll, I'll look into that. And so he got a, a gym membership, and he went to the gym on the first day of the week. So Sunday, he went once a week for a month, and he sat there, he pulled up a chair, and he watched other people work out. <laughs> and... Uh, this is great. You know, people, these people are getting really sweaty. This is great. But after about a month, he realized that nothing was really, you know, changing in his own situation. So he figured he probably missed something. And so he went on to his friend Google and typed in things to be healthy and strong. And also healthy eating also comes up uh, quite a amount, quite a lot. And so he decided to go to a bunch of restaurants and he watched other people who were eating healthy things like salads and juices and fruits and vegetables, you know, all the good things. Uh, and he got some weird looks sometimes because he's trying to, you know, track down these people who are, you know, uh, eating these healthy things. But he noticed that after a month, it's like nothing is changing. I'm still, you know, experiencing nothing for my own health. And so he goes to a wise friend of his and explains the situation. And this wise friend says to him, no, you, you've got it all wrong. If you want to be healthy and strong, you actually have to do things yourself that make you healthy and strong. You can't be watching what other people are doing to make them healthy and strong. You need to do those things yourself. And the guy's like, oh, that was my mistake. If you want to become a healthy and strong disciple of Jesus, it's not about watching what other people do to become healthy and strong disciples of Jesus, although the things that people say can be instructive, they can help you in those ways, but you need to do things yourself to be a strong, healthy disciple of Jesus. And so the key phrase here is to be proactive, not passive. Now, as I set this message up like this today, I just want to say and acknowledge that this is a different uh, type of message. I haven't done one like this uh, in the years that I've been here. It's not really a sermon. It's a talk about sermons and how to get the most out of them. So historically, we, we refer to sermons as a means of grace. And this is sort of a, a kind of a churchy word. So what is the means of grace? And so really, uh, a means of grace, historically, there's a variety of things which are called means of grace. It's, it's a channel of God's divine generosity, guidance, and help in our lives. A channel of God's divine generosity, guidance, and help in our lives. Wow, that's, that's interesting. So there's a couple things that we also put in that category. Scripture is historically referred to as a means of grace, as a channel of God's divine generosity, goodness, help, and guidance in your life. We acknowledge that. Prayer is a historic means of grace. Communion is a historic means of grace. Certain types of volunteering or fasting, these are things that God gives us to do for his divine generosity, guidance, and help to come into our lives. But when it comes to something like preaching, because we are listening, we can make the mistake and think that this is something passive that we do and not something proactive that we do, but that is a fundamental mistake, and it's to misunderstand what it is as a means of grace. And so as we start this, I just want to acknowledge that for me, it's kind of awkward because like I'm the preacher, uh, and so, so I say that. And what I say, I would say in any context, in any situation. So it's not really even, uh, you know, it's, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship to what I'm saying and, and to the effectiveness of a preacher. And so this is about the historic means of grace that God has set aside for us. There's a variety of them, of which preaching is one. And what I'm about to say is true whether the preacher is older, younger, long-winded, short-winded, whether they're eloquent or cumbersome. And what I'm about to say is conditional on the fact that the Holy Spirit takes what a preacher says in their own prayerful preparation and does something with it. And it's all up to the Holy Spirit. So it's not like if, if um, I am, you know, if, I, if a preacher has had a difficult week and they haven't had the time to prepare that they should, and, uh, you know, they go in and Sunday comes, you can't delay Sunday. It always arrives. If this occurs, you know, the Holy Spirit can take that and do a powerful thing with it in the lives of the people who are listening. And at the same time, a preacher can have like everything together and, oh, I got this great quote and this great illustration, aren't I clever? And they're really eloquent and everything else. And God's Spirit might decide to pass over that sermon 
and not use it in a special way, okay? So it's all dependent upon the Holy Spirit. But what I do is I, I acknowledge that this is also like a significant part of what we do. Like there's a lot of sermons going around as our lives of faith through the years. And so my hope is that this is helpful for you because I want you to get the most out of this experience. That's whether you're new to the faith, whether you're you know, you've been mature, you're around for a while, whether you're 18, 35, 105, doesn't matter. And also specifically, if through the years you've listened to sermons and you, you kind of struggle to engage or connect or why do we do this or, or how do I get more out of it, my hope is that this is beneficial for you. And so part of our issue today is also because of the culture in which we live and the times in which we live, which makes actually sermon listening much more difficult. So I'm going to highlight three reasons. And the first is that our entertainment culture has shaped us to be spectators who want to be entertained. We cannot underestimate how powerful that is. And we bring this kind of, this kind of entertainment culture thinking into worship as well. Oh, and just like someone's talking or singing on TV, entertain me, we can think that's true for the preacher. Not so. Second, because of media and technology, we actually have shorter attention spans, and lessened ability to concentrate. This is part, there's been sociological studies on this. There's research on this because of gadgets and data and information and how much we consume. It's actually harder for us to concentrate with these frazzled brains. You hear these stories, um, you know, Sunday schools are a fairly modern invention, but uh, you know, these, these eight-year-olds, you know, listening to standard 45-minute sermons, being able to repeat key points to their parents, we're not there a- anymore. Uh, but we have how, how culture functions, technology, we actually have these, these uh, frazzled brains, so it makes it harder for us to concentrate. Third, we can easily forget what a sermon is and how God uses it. And so if we think it's a random talk by some random person, we're, we're always going to struggle with saying, how God might use this to communicate personally with me in my life. But if we understand actually what it is as a means of grace, then we actually might be more open to what God might actually be communicating to us specifically through something called a sermon. So get this. So let's say that you go to church services for 20 years and you go every other Sunday. Okay, this is just a a number out out of thin air. And let's, so how much is that? That's 520 sermons, or 13,000 minutes of preaching. Wow. So, and that's just 20, and some of you are much more than that, but like, that's every other Sunday. So, the reason I say this is because don't you want to get the most out of this experience? Or do we want to kind of just wrestle with it and struggle to engage or struggle to see how it connects to our lives and always kind of sit there with our ears kind of metaphorically plugged somewhat? So here's how we're going to proceed. First, I'm going to read Nehemiah 8, 1 to 12 as an example of proactive attentiveness. Second, I'm going to share some important mindsets for us to have. And third, I'm going to share some very practical things for us to do. So first, Nehemiah 8, uh, 1 to 12. And so uh, historically, where we are is, and and again, I said this isn't a real sermon, so I'm not just going through all the the line by line and explaining, but I want to read it and highlight a few quick things. Um, because this is instructive for us, and this is in the Old Testament. So as you recall, God's people are, are you know, they're conquered by a foreign power, they're exiled to a foreign land, and uh, they eventually come back. So, so think like 445 B.C., so this is, you know, several centuries before the birth of Christ. And Nehemiah and some others come, and they, you know, he, as the governor, is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, because so much of Jerusalem had been destroyed by this foreign power. And they're gathered there, yeah, this is the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, it's in the autumn, and so this is what we read. And all the people gathered as one man or as one into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, what the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. So everyone's gathered, men, women, and children. Everyone who can hear is gathered for this. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform so that they had made for the people. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. On his right hand, Padiah, Mishael, Milkaijah, Hashum, Hashabanadad, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And yes, I practiced those names ahead of time. (laughs) 
but the idea is, the idea is these are most likely community leaders who have gathered for this important reading of, of the law of God. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And he, as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jemin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Paliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. <laughs> then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine. Send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so notice what is happening. is First of all, the teachings of God are considered authoritative. So that's clear from the passage. The second thing is that the teachings of God are read and explained. So verse 8 says, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And so not only was there the presentation of a text, which the community deemed to be authoritative to them, but there was an explanation of it. And third is that the people are attentive and respond in faith. So clearly we get that. They're worshiping, they're bowing down, they're saying amen. And uh, notice also they're weeping. Now, why in the world are they weeping? Well, chances are they've seen how they've been unfaithful to the law of God, and so <laughs> they're sorry. And so the, they're weeping to such a degree that the Levites actually have to say, no, 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 calm down, this is a festival day. And so God is forgiving and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, right? Jonah 4. All this sort of stuff, but, but then they're to celebrate, receive the goodness of God. And so that's instructive to us. Okay, so with that in mind, that posture, let's go for some important mindsets to have. And the first is just knowing what preaching is. And this is important. I've already explained it as a means of grace dependent upon the Holy Spirit, not a broken, you know, imperfect pastor. So when the Holy Spirit takes something, it is this means of grace. It can be, at God's will, this channel of his generosity, help, and wisdom in your life. But more specifically, it is this. A sermon is the explanation and application of a biblical passage, which is why the scripture is so very, very important. When I stray from this, or when someone else strays from this, you go into the proverbial ditch. And so it's about explaining and applying it to our lives. So one of the Puritans named Charles Simeon had a great word about the goal of preaching. He says, it's to humble the sinner, to exalt the Savior, and to promote holiness. Humble the sinner, we're to see ourselves realistically and humbly, to exalt the Savior, Jesus, to make him the hero, because he is, and then to promote holiness, meaning we want to glorify God and grow as disciples in the footsteps of Jesus. So I think that's helpful. Now our foundation to all this is the scriptures. And we need to be reminded of this. Hear what the scriptures themselves say about its own teaching. They're inspired by God or breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. They're sufficient to help you understand and receive salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15. They point us to Jesus, John 5. They are true, Psalm 119. They are perfect, reviving the soul, Psalm 19. They're to be studied because they help us love God with all our minds. Luke 10, Mark 12. Or a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, Psalm 119. Spiritual food we need to live, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. They're to be taught to children. Deuteronomy 6, are to be pondered continually, Psalm 1, Joshua 1, and teach us our purpose in life, how to live, how to be wise, how to be faithful. Various passages. Wow. So no wonder this is so central to who we are as God's people. Okay. So with that in mind, here's the next one. We need to be confident or get confident in the trustworthiness and authority of the Bible. This is huge. 
Because if we think that this is some random book that God has nothing to do with or that humans have, have just made up on their own, we will never take anything it says or anything that is taught about it seriously. Hear this. So this uh, past week, Dwayne Klein, who's a pastor in Hamilton, put together an article for the Gospel Coalition uh, Canada, and this is what he says about the position of Scripture changing in culture and in the lives even of believers. Quote, The prevalent worldview on Scripture has shifted from it's God's book to it's one of God's books, to it's a good book, to it is a corrupt, unjust, and unethical book. The cultural ideology has penetrated the minds of many believers. They have an inaccurate view of Scripture that is shaped more by culture than by historical Orthodox Christianity, he writes. That shift has caused many believers to question, redefine, and even deny the authority of Scripture. And so, end quote. So I'm not going to get into all those issues today, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But the key is for you is if you don't have a growing confidence and, and, a, and a confidence in your mind, you need to get confident. And there's so many resources to help you do that. If you need some help, let me know. Next, we need to cultivate humility. If we were to be open to what God might be see, speaking to us. And so I'd like you to imagine a big, hairy, gnarly ball in the middle of your chest, it's alive. It's got a face, it's got googly eyes, it's got um, mouth and these mangled teeth with all this plaque and tartar. And, the, and this, this hairy ball that's inside your chest all day says, me, 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 me. <laughs> and that hairy ball has a name, it's called pride. And so what humility is, Humility is working on getting that <laughs> me, 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 pride, hairy ball thing out of your chest to make room for God to come in. And when we cultivate humility, when we have a realistic view of ourselves under the grace of God, we start to allow his, his truth and wisdom to come into us and also prioritize the needs of other people. That's really what the process of humility is because let me tell you this, we cannot be full of God's wisdom if we are already full of ourselves. We cannot be full of God's wisdom if we are already full of ourselves. Next mindset is this. It is to, actually I forgot to put this on a slide, so hold on a second. Guard against Satan's plan to make you apathetic to or absent from sermons. Let me say it again. We need to guard against Satan's plan to make you apathetic to or absent from sermons. So, granted, there are times when you, you can't be to worship, you can't uh, take in sermons. Um, maybe you're sick, maybe you're working, you're out of town, whatever, whatever reason. So I get that. This, is, this isn't about that. But have you ever wondered why sometimes it's hard to come to worship? Maybe there's some other reason. It, it's difficult. Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. So if scriptural teaching is based on the word of God, which is true, which it is, isn't part of his agenda just to make you not care, not be there? not show up, not listen to what God might be communicating with you. In Mark 4.15, Jesus says this, and this is the parable of the sower. Some people are like seed along the path where this word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. I remember talking with someone who had gone through a difficult time, and, and uh, sometimes it's after you go through something difficult, coming back to church on a Sunday can be, can be a challenge. And... Um, uh, it, was, it was a personal challenge that they had gone through, uh, she had gone through in her life. And, uh, and she told me that when she would, for the first while when she would, she would come to worship, she would repeat something to herself. The devil's not going to win. The devil's not going to win. The devil's not going to win. Practical things to do. First, pray. Pray for the preacher to faithfully understand, explain, and apply God's word. And so I need your prayers. And so if I'm the shepherd of this congregation, which I am, um, and if you call Westminster your church home, you need to be praying for me, right? We've got this thing where we invite everyone who calls Westminster their church family to be praying for the church at least two minutes every day. I've been saying this for like six months. Um, so I, I invite you to pray for me also. If I'm spending time studying and praying over what this might be for you, and it's not just a teaching moment, it's a pastoral moment. Over half of the care that I provide for you is through teaching. 
And so pray for me. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, who was, he was a great Baptist preacher uh, in the 1800s, uh, people from different walks of life admire Charles Spurgeon, such a great, powerful preacher. While he preached, underneath the pulpit where he was, there was a room underneath the church. People gathered, and the entire time he was preaching, they were praying for him. That's amazing. I love that. Now, I don't even know what's below me somewhere in the Sunday school. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. We don't need to do that. But I do ask, invite you to be praying for me as I prepare to teach you as we glorify God, as we grow, as we learn, as we grow in Christ-likeness. The next thing is you need to pray for your personal illumination ahead of time. And this is something practically that you can be doing. Holy Spirit, illumine me. So maybe there's something you're struggling with or, or you want help with, whatever it happens to be. Pray for your personal illumination. So leading up to Sunday, and especially on Saturday, I'm praying for you. Lord God, bring us together as your people and help us to, to glorify you, to learn, to grow as disciples of Jesus. For the person who comes and who does not yet know you, may they come to know you. Help us to grow in that. Per speak to that person who's struggling and they need a word of encouragement. Whatever it happens to be, I'm praying those things for you leading up to Sunday. And up to this moment, you need to be praying for yourself that the Holy Spirit opens you and illumines you to what he might have to say to you. And so in light of that, next, expect God to communicate with you. Expect it. Anticipate that you, for your personal prayers, whatever you happen to be dealing with, that the Lord is going to communicate something specifically with you that you need to hear. And it's not just me talking. It's me talking. But there are certain times and all of a sudden you're going to realize, wait a second, God is speaking something through this imperfect preacher to me in my situation. One of the things I love is when afterwards, and it doesn't happen always, but sometimes, and someone will say, I felt like today you were talking directly to me. That happens sometimes, and that's not me. That's God in his grace and generosity reaching out to someone, communicating something they need to hear. I remember one time <clears throat> after I'd been here a couple years, and someone came up to me and they were talking to me afterwards and said, I've been struggling with a certain situation, and... I've been praying about, you know, X, Y, and Z. So when you said in your sermon X, Y, and Z, I was like, wow, God is answering my prayer and helping me with this situation. But here's the thing. I did not say X, Y, and Z. I know what I say. I plan it out. It's written out. I did not say X, Y, and Z. So what happened in that moment? Was it maybe that God was using the moment in worship to communicate some encouragement to that person J.A. Packer writes, if we dare to ask God to let us hear his word to us personally about our lives, he will. And so that, all those people I mentioned, the thing they have in common is they expect God to communicate with them. Next, I encourage you to be, be attentive. Uh, and so uh, you notice one of the things that Jesus says. Uh, he says it in Mark 4, 9, but he says it elsewhere as well. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, why would he say that? Of course we have ears to hear. We hear. No, no, no. You, you, you can have ears and, and you can listen and sometimes not hear, right? Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Don't just listen because sometimes we listen and don't actually hear. And so uh, there's a few things that, that I just want to encourage you with and, and maybe this will be helpful to you. Maybe this is... You're, you're like, you're engaged all the time and you get it and you're praying and you're anticipating that God's going to speak to you, all these sorts of things, and you're involved in the Bible. You're, you're doing the applications. You're doing everything. So maybe none of this is an issue for you. But for those of you who struggle a little bit, here's some tips. First, you could just bring your Bible, right? And so some people do this. Some people don't. Some people like to write their Bible. Some people don't want to, like, dirty up their pretty Bible by writing in it. Like, that's whatever you want. That's fine. But bringing your Bible, this kind of became popular with, with, with the Puritans in the 1600s, and it has continued in uh, some Protestant traditions. Maybe that, that helps you follow along. Different translation, that's okay. Uh, use the sermon notes. Uh, so that can be another helpful thing as well, uh, if, you, if you kind of uh, struggle to follow along or remember things. And so the sermon notes are, they look like this, and you can get them on the welcome desk, and it's just got some different categories that you can fill in. Uh, and at the same time, if you are at home and you click on the PDF where you get the, the live stream, you can get it there as well. And it's also available in the church app. So sometimes you're going to see someone filling in something on their phone, and uh, they might not be checking their email. <laughs> they might actually be using the sermon notes. And there's some people, I've had a few people come up to me and say, hey, I'm using the sermon notes. I'm, I'm actually paying attention. It's okay. You know? So that can be a way. 
Uh, another thing is when your mind wanders, bring it back. Hey, it happens. You're there, you know, you're preaching at Sunday morning. Maybe you're up a bit late on Saturday and you think about, oh my goodness, I've got this calculus test on Tuesday at two. How am I going to get time to study? Or I forgot to pick up bananas at no frills. Whatever it is, it's okay. Bring your mind back and God will plug you in uh, again. All right, next, reflect on it afterwards. This can be helpful, okay? So, you think about it afterwards, so maybe this is yourself, maybe it's with a friend, maybe it's people in the car or your household, whatever it happens to be. And so the way that sermons are structured, or the way that I structure them, is quite often I've kind of summarized the main point in a very short, succinct statement, which is hopefully uh, memorable to you. And so last week it was live like royalty. Okay, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, and the kingdom charter is the Sermon on the Mount, so we are to live like royalty. And so it's something you can carry with you, and maybe you talk about it with someone or reflect upon it about yourself. Oh, today I have this difficult person to deal with. Okay, how can I respond to that like royalty? How might I respond to that situation like someone uh, in a kingdom that is not of this world? And so that's one of the ways. And a couple weeks ago, it was trust God, not your gut, right? Or, you know, joy is a diet, not a pill. And so the idea is we can reflect on these over time and these applications to our uh, lives. Uh, maybe it's a discussion group. Maybe it's a small group. It's the vine, whatever it happens to be. These things reiterate the point in your lives. Next, follow through on the applications. So sermons include an application, right? That's what sermons are. It's the explanation of a biblical text and an application. And so there are times when I will say something very specific to you. Okay, then I think in light of what we have learned, you should do such and such. And so if you actually do those things, it's a way for you to uh, firm up in your heart and mind what we have discussed and learned. And so last week, for example, it was review the kingdom charter, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So hopefully through the week in your devotional reading, you sat down and read Matthew 5, 6, 7, reflecting on, oh, this is what it means to live like royalty. And so when you follow through on the applications, it further solidifies and makes these roots go down deeper within you, Okay. Uh, Joel Beakey tells a story about a man who came home from a worship service, and his wife had stayed home because she was sick. And uh, <clears throat> the preacher's sermon was shorter than usual, so he came home in the back door sooner than she expected. Donald, is that you already? Is the sermon done already? Oh, it's me, dear, he said, but the sermon is not done. It has been spoken, but it has yet to be done. End quote. And the idea is that a sermon isn't really done until it has been acted upon by God's people. Okay, that includes you. Next, keep track of key insights. <clears throat> so this is, again, something optional. Some people do this, and I just give this by way of an idea. Some people have a little journal, so something that stood out to them, and they'll make a note of it. I know someone who really marks up their Bible and they have little sticky notes on the side. So here's something that I think God was communicating to me in this passage this week. And here's another reason why this is important. We're so forgetful as people, and this isn't you, it's me, it's all of us, it's our culture, is we pray for God about something. God, give me guidance on this certain issue in my life. And we're like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm supposed to figure this out on my own. But what happens if we start recording you know, the things people say or the scripture passage we came along or this sermon on this topic, we actually start to notice that, wait a second, there's actually repeated themes that, that God is putting into my life time and time again. He actually is responding to me. It's just that I'm not really paying attention. So that can be a helpful thing for you. And then finally, if you miss a sermon, listen to it uh, later. And so there are some things about technology that make you want to just stab your eye with a rusty spoon. Like technology <laughs> is just... Sorry for the visual, but technology just drives you crazy sometimes. Um, uh, but sometimes there are good things about technology. One of the things is if we miss something, we're struggling with something, hey, what, what, what did the preacher say? Maybe there was something in here that was speaking into my life. You can find it. Like you can go on to Westminster under sermons. You can go to my website. It's linked in the devotional. Uh, we have a podcast called The Word at Westminster. It's everywhere. And so maybe you missed it. You're like, wait a second, as I take the bus to school, I'm going to listen. Or as I drive home from work, I'm, I'm going to recap that. Or I'm going to listen to it as I walk the dog. Whatever it happens to be, this is a way for us to review. So let me just summarize what I've shared with you this morning. We first looked at Nehemiah 8 as an example of proactive attentiveness. Second, we looked at important mindsets for us to have, including knowing what preaching is, being confident or getting confident in the trustworthiness and authority of the Bible, Cultivating humility, 
We've talked about guarding against Satan's plan to make you apathetic to or absent from sermons. Then we looked at some practical ideas of things to do. Pray for the preacher to faithfully understand, explain, and apply God's word. Pray for your personal illumination ahead of time. It's like cultivating the soil in a garden before you plant seeds. That's what praying for illumination for yourself is. Next, expect God to communicate to you. We've talked about being attentive. We talked about reflecting on it afterwards, following through on applications, keeping track of key insights. If you miss a sermon, listen to it later. And so these summaries are a little insert like this, which is in the welcome desk. And so if you want to kind of pick up, review some of these so that you get the most out of it, you can pick one of these up on the way out, and we'll make it available on the website as well. So as a closing thought, I was recently reading about people who lived through the Great Depression. Like, these people went through amazing, incredible things, and they, they got the most out of things. They did not waste stuff. It's amazing. Like, clothes, there was a tear in some clothes. Like, you didn't throw clothes out. You fixed it. You sewed it. You had extra patches of material to put on it and do everything. It's, it's amazing. Um, water, you know, kids you know, bathing in in bath water, using it multiple times. We don't do that as much anymore. Um, But like, it's amazing. And and one of the things that shocked me most and impressed me was tires. Car tires were used in a variety of ways. So you use them on your vehicle until they wear out. Uh, But then when they wear out, you don't throw them out. You use it. Like maybe in a garden, you use it for something and a plant comes up. Um, I heard about one custom of breaking the tire apart and using the pieces of the rubber to edge your garden or even to use some of that robust, durable rubber to fix certain things in your house. It's like, that's amazing to me. Um, And so they really didn't waste things, and they got the most out of everything they had. And my question is, what if we were just as diligent with the means of grace that God has set out before us, whether that's scripture, worship, prayer, fasting, communion, volunteering, preaching, whatever it happens to be, And so the key phrase is, is to be proactive, not passive. To be proactive, not passive. Listening is a verb. Brothers and sisters, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Amen. Please rise.